Okay, hi. Am I too loud? My volume okay? Thanks for watching. I'm Matt Taylor from Numinta, and uh, this is AI chat, AI neuroscience chat. But uh, we're gonna talk generally about both, I think. So we had a good, good chat last week, and the chat box is up and working. If you didn't notice it, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Volume is good. Thank you. Thanks for listening. So, um, before I start, oh, what you're hearing is Caravan Strive by Santana. This is the first uh, track on the album. This is the best Santana album, in my opinion. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Wrong things. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, so, what do I want to do? Um, so, first of all, you probably notice I've only been doing this Twitch thing for this is my third real week doing it, my second Monday probably. And so the second sort of AI chat show, I'm working on like overlay stuff. So you might notice I'm, I, I put this on top and this on the bottom. I'm hoping that this is like the title. It is a artificial intelligence chat episode two. And I'm gonna talk about just HTM basics today. Um, and I think the, the viewers thing over there looks good too, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to, I'm sort of testing it out today, so we'll see. Seven, all right. It's updates like once a minute or so. Um, so good news, uh, if you look at my Twitch page, I am now a Twitch affiliate, which is nice. I, I, you have to get a certain amount of followers or something, so I can uh, have things like subscriptions and do neater things in chat. I can create VIPs in chat, and so it's a, it gives us me a lot of tools to engage more with the community. So I think that's, that'll be fun. And so what I'll do to celebrate that is at the end of this little chat, I will gift um, five subscriptions to this channel and, and um, randomly. So whoever's in chat at that time, Twitch will like randomly gift five subscriptions and that will give you ad free streaming on this channel, on my channel. And I think you'll get access to custom emo emotes, which I haven't made yet but I'll, I'll make them and like a subscriber badge, which I haven't made yet, but I'll make, I'm gonna make those. So, um, yeah, so, so that's fun. Uh, and so I'm happy I got more than 50 subscribers watching. Um, so let me, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is I noticed that I got some comments on YouTube from last week. So let me go, um, I want to go over some of those and try and answer them. Uh, so let me find them. I, I just put all of the Twitch videos on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel here. <laughs> and so I didn't really know what to expect with that, how they would be received because, so uh, let me turn this off. I didn't know how they would be received because um, all my other videos I try and make a bit more polished, but I got good, good feedback and a lot of people watching them on YouTube, which is, which is good, it's sort of encouraging. So I have been replying to the comments here, but there's one in particular that I wanted to look at. Please stop talking about deep learning. You have no experience at all and your statements are misleading or, or plainly wrong. Every bachelor student at Stun Neural Network course can bring up a strong arguments and evidence against most of your statements. I am uh, not an expert in deep learning. It may be true that I said something wrong or inaccurate in the last meetup. If so, please tell me uh, what I'm wrong about. This particular comment doesn't tell me what I'm wrong about. So. I would be happy to have a conversation with anybody uh, who wants to join in chat or Twitch or whatever. Um, and uh, if I'm wrong about something, I want to know because I'm looking for what's right. I'm looking for the truth, the right answer. So uh, please uh, engage me in chat or in uh, email me at matt at nementa.org if you don't want to do it publicly. Um, I am open to being corrected about any of this stuff for sure. So uh, for the most part, I think everybody was happy that uh, this content was being made available on YouTube, so I'm just gonna keep doing it. And I got a nice spike in views, so I'm just gonna keep um, pushing this stuff. Um, still, what, what do you mean? You, I still have the opening slide showing. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you can see my screen, right? I mean, I'm not, view, I'm not viewing the video. I'm just, I just had it paused, so. Um, okay, next thing on the agenda, oh. <laughs> This is kind of neat. Let me see if this shows up. Uh, if I go to my Twitch page, I have this poll down here. 
You're gonna see the Twitch page. Uh, I should be able to, yeah, so there's this poll down here. I think maybe I can, there should be a way to put it up. I thought it would show up like on the stream as you're watching it, but apparently it doesn't. I guess I didn't configure it correctly. Uh, but, uh, but I thought it would be fun to have a poll. This one is just, I gave this on YouTube as well. When will truly intelligent machines be a reality? So if you're interested, go to, go to my, down on my Twitch page and vote on this poll. Um, next time I do a poll, I'll figure out how to have it, you know, uh, pop up live while you're watching, because I know there's a, there's a way you can embed it sort of in the video. I'm going to shut that, that stream down because um, I don't need to stream two things at once. Um, uh, okay, so uh, how's everybody doing? How many people we got? Eight, eight or so in chat? That's great. I'm glad you guys showed up. Um, at any point in time, if you want me to explain anything, please let me know. Some of you guys are old HTM forum people, or not, you're not old people, but you know, you've been around and you know the basics of what I'm going to talk about. But even if um, you just want me to go over something in particular, uh, I'd be happy to. So, because I'm just going to whiteboard it today. Um, you can ignore this. This is a future plan. Future plan. I love time series databases, and Influx is a time series database. And I, I want to do something with it. So, uh, so let's, I mean, when we're talking about HTM, I think, especially if you know something about deep learning or about machine learning, um, the, one of the most important things that you have to think about is sparsity. And if you look at your brain at any point in time, I just happen to have one right here. If you look at a brain <laughs> at any point in time, and I don't know if this is exactly true in every single part of the brain, but I'm gonna, this one comes apart nicely. So let's, let's just talk about the neocortex, which is like this part, without the inside, without the old brain stuff, the thalamus, the midbrain and all that. This stuff, the, the, the neurons in here that are doing computation, if you were to take a snapshot of your brain at, at one point in time, you would see that of all the trillions of billions or whatever neurons that are in here, only 2% of them are actually like in a firing state are like re releasing their action potential are like their voltage is high, they're, they're firing, they're spiking, whatever you want to call it. Only 2% of those. So if you think about that, like logically, you might say that that's, uh, that why aren't we using all of our brain? You know, why are we only using 2% of our brain? That, that's not what, that's, we are using all of our brain all the time. It's, it's not like uh, just because only 2% are sparse that that's, that's uh, we're only using part of the brain. Um, sparsity is really, really important to the brain um, because when you have a, a representation, it, are you not seeing the video? I, I, it should be streaming video right now. I'm hoping that, let me do a stream check. I had to do this one time before. Um, uh, Mark says he's having a hard time uh, seeing the video. If anybody else is also, you say it's all good. Thanks, thanks for the check. Um, I know there's a stream health check I can do here. It looks, it says excellent. So I don't know, Mark, I don't know what to tell you, sorry. Um, but you can always check it on YouTube. It, but Mark, you know all this stuff anyway. I know, I know you're being supportive and I appreciate it, but I know you know all this stuff. So a refresh fixed it. So if you're having video problems, refresh. Um, anyhow, Sparsity is important. The, one of the reasons it's important, and, and it's not just sparsity necessarily, um, it's distribution of semantic meaning as well. So we talk about this in HTM terms. We talk about, uh, not spacity, did I? Spacity, spacity, spar, sparse. We call them sparse distributed representation. Sparse because in the population of neurons that are, will represent something, sparse city, um, only a small percentage of them will actually be on doing the representation at any point in time. Distributed because you want to take that semantic uh, idea of the thing being represented and distribute it across the population of neurons so it's not just focused in one area. And uh, obviously it is a representation of something. So when we talk about neurons, especially populations of neurons and activations of those neurons and SDRs in that sense, where an SDR 
is a collection essentially of neurons and their on or off state. So all of our SDRs are essentially bit arrays. It's just a big list of neurons and which ones in that list are on and which ones are off. Um, and this has semantics. It means something. All the bits mean something. You know, the best way to do this is still with uh, HTM school stuff. So hold on. Let me, I, I've got visualizations of this. So let me just open it up. Um, this is, here we go. So, uh, all right. So this is the best way to visualize it, in my opinion. Um, so this is a bit array. Let's make it a big bit array. So here's a bit array of 2,048 bits. Has anybody seen this, seen this visualization before? Raise your hand or, get, or say one or something in chat. Um, because this is like one of the first things that I put, the, one of the first HTM visualizations I made and, and put into uh, HTM school. Um, but essentially in this, yeah, so we've got a couple, that's good. So there's five bits that are on in this set. Usually we don't, we keep it to four, but it doesn't matter. We're gonna keep it sparse, which is, even this is pretty sparse. Um, the thing you have to realize that why sparsity matters is if you've got, I don't know, even half of these bits on, let's say a thousand or so of them on, there's a certain number of ways that those bits, those 1,500 bits can fit into this space. 2048 spaces. This is one of them, right? This is just one randomly chosen arrangement of these bits in space. Um, but there's a whole bunch of others, and there's actually, you know, a mathematical formula. This and this one, it's there's so many of them that <laughs> there's so many ways that you could fit those those bits in that space that it's essentially infinity. Okay. <laughs> the denser the representation is, the more ways you can fit the bits in a space. So when you enforce sparsity in a population like this, you're losing capacity, right? Which makes sense because that, I mean, I can understand why people wanted to use, why dense representation seemed like a natural way to, to represent things because you can represent so many different unique things, an infinite amount of unique things in this space. You could put values in here until the end of time, you know? Um, but with sparsity, you lose that. You see the capacity going down. I didn't use mathematic notation because I like lots of zeros. But um, it's really a big number. Even, even if we dial the sparsity down really low, we typically use 40, which, uh, no, 40 which, out of 2048, which is 2% sparsity, which is the amount of neurons in your brain. So this is a good representation uh, of your brain and the amount of neurons that are on. You know, not, not a ton of neurons, right? Um, so why? So there's, there's certain properties of the sparsity that are super, super important to how your brain computes. And, and the, I'm just talking about capacity, even with this amount, you know, fewer than the dense representation, but even with this, the capacity for storage in the space is just huge. It's just huge. You'll, you really won't run out of space to store things in, in this space even using a, a, a sparsity that's so low, you know, 2%. Um, so realizing that, we can understand some more things about SDRs. Um, if, you're, if you like uh, these visualizations, give me a follow, because I'm gonna show a lot of visualizations, I hope, in, this, in, in my uh, uh, channel here, having to do with HTMs. I wanna build more, more visualizations. I wanna do 3D visualizations of HTM systems, which I've done in the past, and I'll show some at some point. Um, so in this example, I've got like two SDRs, one on the left and one on the right, and they're both different and they're both random. Um, on the left, they're both the same size and they have the same W. So their sparsity is like 10%. Yeah. And I did 10% just because I want to show you, uh, what happens when you compare them. So you can do two comparisons with SDRs that we, your brain is doing all the time in, in different ways. Um, one is an overlap. Okay, so basically when you take an overlap, I'll take the one on the left over there and I'll put it over top of the one on the right and what you see, or the center, excuse me, I'll put it over top of the one on the center and what you see on the right is the overlap. Those are the bits in the array or in, in the space where, where both on and both of the 
comparators, right? Um, so that's called an overlap. That tells you what is similar between the two representations. You have to remember these SDRs, these sparse, sparse distributed representations, have meaning. Like they, they, this, the bits mean something. You might not know what they mean, but they mean something. If you take a neuron out of your brain, and and you don't know, you don't know what any neuron in particular is doing. If you just point at it, but it's doing something. It's playing a role in who thousands of computations, most likely, you know, in, in some way or another. And if you take it out, it, it isn't going to affect the computation of the whole population. It'll be a super minor degradation of the system. So these, because of everything sparse and because of these comparisons or uh, the way that the, they're compared, um, they're also like inherently tolerant to, to fault, right? So if any, if any of these neurons, for whatever reason, decided to die or, or just didn't happen to fire that, that, that particular time, this comparison, this overlap is still going to be super similar than, than before. Okay, so overlap is one of the, the important things to think about. The other is a union. And that's and these are just basically a binary and is an overlap or a binary or, which is a union. And the binary or is just going to give you all of the bits where both of them, or either one of them, excuse me, in that space, either one of them had an on. Um, and this is a way to accumulate, to, to sort of like have a bucket and fill it up with things and, and fill it up with features. And, when, and what you can do with this, let me just show you the comparison real quick. This just kind of shows you, we, we typically will call, do it, use an overlap score to identify how close two representations are. Um, yeah, so Mark is saying the bits mean something, right? In computers, this, that's, a good, that's a good point, Mark. In computers, if you're looking at like ASCII code, for a five or something for the letter five uh, number, excuse me, the number five. Um, and you change, like you can, that resolves down to an array of bits, ASCII does essentially. And if you changed one of those bits, it would change the five to something random. Like it might be an asterisk or it might be um, a bracket or it might be a seven, or it might be an A, I don't know. But, um, it would not be anywhere near a five, right? You can't make any assumptions about that. With these, if you change the bits in the representations, you're guaranteed that it'll be similar because, because these representations are sort of cumulative, right? Um, so that, that's a good point. It says, um, each, in SDRs, each bit stands for something. It'd be silly to have all the bits turned on, meaning everything at once. It, it'd just be a complete overload, right? It wouldn't mean anything, right? It'd mean nothing. Um, so let me show you a bit about uh, matching, is this the one I want to do? Uh, I haven't done this in a while. I'm um, just, is just like, ma oh, this shows you, okay, this, this sort of introduces a threshold. So I'm going to turn the noise down. Um, this is where the, this is where the record skips. Hold on. It's a brand new record. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, yeah, thanks for the ASCII for five and binary. I appreciate it. Flip one of those. Flip one of those and tell me what you get. It'll be something completely different. Um, yeah, so there's a great video on this uh, that, I'll, uh, that I'll put into chat. Cortical I.O. semantic folding. I really like this. I misspelled that, I think. Semantic folding. Here it is. Um, so I'm not going to watch through it right now. Let me let me pause it though and find. There's a couple of great scenes in this video uh, when they're talking about SDRs. So here it is. This is so if the, if an SDR were representing cat, this is a great example. You might have a bit that means pointing ear or tail or whatever, um, and but the whole meaning for cat is distributed across the whole representation. So if you have one for dog, one for cat. They, they might not have the same bits defining their ears, but they might have other bits saying that they're furry that overlap. Anyway, let me put this into chat and I'll let you guys watch that and your leisure. Um, there you go. Uh, so what I want to show here is this idea of matching with theta. And this is a super important operation to do in, in HTM because you want to compare representations. You want to, you want to see from a neuron standpoint, if I'm a neuron and I've got all these dendrites, right? And basically I'm observing all the synapses and all those dendrites. And sometimes I want, because of the things happening on those dendrites, I may want to change my state. I might want to fire. I might want to become predictive, etc. 
Um, hey, Anna Beta, thanks for, thanks for coming along. I'm talking about neuroscience stuff. I'm actually talking about sparsity in the brain right now and how uh, you know, very few of your brain cells, your pyramidal neurons in your, in your neocortex specifically are on at any one point in time. And, and with the kinds of attributes you get from, from that sparsity when you're trying to do computation, you know, and, you know, cognitive, uh, cognitive computations and stuff. Um, so I'm going to show you, first I'll put the noise down to nothing. So I've got an original SDR here on the left. Now, and I guess I will add a little bit of noise. We'll add 20% noise. So, so what, we, what I did here was I kept the sparsity the same, but I just took 20% of the bits and like flipped them or something like that, right? And then when I compare them, I get an overlap score. So out of the 40 bits, 32 of them were the same between these two because that noise, that 20% noise, messed with eight of those bits. Um, so we can use this idea of theta, meaning how many bits do I need before I will consider the comparison to be a match. That's typically when we're talking about sparsity, sparse distributed representations. Um, when we talk about theta, we're talking about the number of bits required for a match in, in the overlap score. Um, so the more noise you add, so in this case, I'll say, okay, I'm gonna say 20 of them, half of the bits in the original SDR on the left there have gotta be in the one you're showing me before I will say that's a match. Right now it says it's a match because 32 of them are good and my noise is, tur is currently 20%. As I dial it up, you can see the overlap score is going down, 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 down. Oh, there we, and there we go. At some point, it, it stopped matching, right? So with 60% uh, noise or somewhere around the 55-ish range, um, we, our, our system broke, like our matching system broke. Um, but that's pretty darn good, you know? That's a whole lot of noise, isn't it? Uh, so you can have some pretty resilient um, pattern matching using this type of sparse distributed representation and doing comparisons with them, um, especially when you, you control the threshold of what you consider a match and what isn't a match. Um, I don't remember what this, this, oh, this is the chance of a false positive. So if I consider my theta, if I make my theta 25 and I say, oh, okay, 25 out of the 40 have to match, um, this just shows me the chance of false positive is really, really small, really small. I mean, m super astronomically small. Um, and you, the proof is it's happening in your brain all the time. I mean, you barely ever think, oh, there's a rabbit, but it's not when you look at it. But every once in a while, right? Every once in a while you say, what was that over there? And you look and there's nothing there, right? Or it was just a blanket folded up, you know? It, your brain pattern matched something that, um, that lit up some, some sparse activations in your head, right? And, and you thought, oh, that's a, that, that matches one time I saw a cat that looked like that, but then you look and you're like, oh, it's not a cat, it's a blanket. Those are the types of false positives that I'm talking about. And generally, when they do happen, um, it's because the thing you're observing is close to what you had thought what was the mismatch, right? Like that blanket might have actually been folded in a way that resembled a cat. So on failure, when you're looking at these SDR systems, they, they pretty much generalize, which is really powerful. So when you're doing comparisons with SDR, when they fail to match or when they match improperly, it's, it's sort of a ge more general error. We, human brains, yeah, Innovata, uh, Innovata has a channel where he talks about neuroscience sometimes and plays games. Um, but yes, we are super good at pattern recognition. I, I, I don't think you're gonna find anything in the world better than pattern recognition than what's in your head right here, right now. So, <laughs> um, yeah, or if some chemicals mess with your neurons, you can always, there's a lot of ways to mess with neurons. I mean, you do get a frontal lobotomy and that'll mess with all the other neurons in your brain too. Um, wouldn't the bed suppress the rabbit idea? Well, you've seen a cat on a bed before, right? Cats are on beds all the time. If it was somewhere that only a blanket would be and never a cat, then yeah, I would say maybe you wouldn't make that pattern recognition. But from what I know about cats, anywhere you might find a blanket, there could be a cat there too. <laughs> you never know. Um, okay, let me go to the next one, which is overlap sets. Is this too deep for you guys? Because I mean, this, I'm basically going over HTM school stuff because I did, I don't know if I showed all these in the videos, but um, it's a little bit too, too much, not too much. Okay, this is great. <laughs> Because I haven't, I haven't looked at this in a long time, so now I have to think about. So I've talked about overlap sets, right? 
if you have an SDR, which here I'm calling at X in this case, and I'm saying it because it has these properties, like there's 600 total bits in it, and we're gonna call the W, which is, we, we, you can ask questions now, Falco, I don't mind taking them anytime. Also, I think I have the Discord chat channel open. Uh, yeah, so if you want to voice chat, you can come in and voice chat in the Discord chat channel, um, which the link is, the link for an invitation to Discord is in, uh, you know, on my Twitch page. Okay, wait for later, that's fine too. Um, I don't mind either way, I'm happy to do it either way. Uh, okay, so in this situation I've got 600 bits. Um, eh, Revolta211, hi, just watched your live coding session. Uh, any estimate for change? Estimate, uh, <laughs> that's a whole other topic. Okay, I'll tell you right now that um, we are not, Nupic is currently in maintenance mode. It has been maintenance mode for well over a year now as we focused on research and completely research and not on building out software. Um, we decided we are, we are not gonna put the effort into upgrade Nupic to Python 3. We're, Numinta is not going to do it. I'm going to start deferring people to the community fork of Nupic, which has an uh, initiative to work uh, towards Python 3. I'm going to make an announcement on the forum very soon. Um, I just wanted to make sure all my ducks are in a row. But since you asked, um, uh, we're going to be uh, not doing any of that stuff that I talked about for, for the most part. Um, anyway, I'll talk about that later. I'm, I'm going to keep talking about SDR stuff right now. Because what you have to realize about um, Nementa, my company, and what we're doing is the theory is the most important thing. There are probably 10, 15 different implementations of HTM algorithms out there, open source on GitHub right now that I could find you. Um, you can look, at, look them up on HTM forum. You can go to nementa.org and under code, there's a few there and you find them pretty quickly when you, when you go to the forum. There's a whole thread on all the different implementations. There's Python and Pony and, and Rust and I haven't seen Haskell one yet, but there's a ton of different implementations. It's not about the code, it's not about new pick it's specifically, I've always said, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go full frontal here. I've always said, since I first started this community for, in 2013, that I didn't think that NewPick would be the HTML implementation that would take the world by storm. NewPick, essentially, its role is more of a reference implementation, so the next generation of HTM engineers and implementers can build something that's really more relevant, I think. And our job as Nementa, I think, is still to continue to focus on the theory. All of our theory builds on all that core stuff in NewPic uh, that I will be talking about, uh, well, that I'm talking about right now. You know, I haven't even talked about HTML algorithms yet. We've only been talking about sparsity. And um, the next thing would be to talk about spatial pooling and the input space and how do you get sensory input into, you know, how can you transform that into a place where you can control the entropy of of the pop, the neuron population. Okay, but that I don't know if I'll, I don't think that's a today topic, but we'll maybe we'll see. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, back to the screen over here. Uh, so this is a small example, 600 bits, 40 on, and I can change them around, but I'll I'll just leave them at, let me just refresh it, leave it at 40 on and a sparsity, and the overlap set is is like the, um, the number of SDRs, uh, I should just stop twiddling things for a moment. The number of SDRs, given that you have a one random SDR with these parameters, right? Where they, it has the same parameters and has exactly 40 bits of overlap. That makes sense, right? In this case, the overlap set is one because there is only one other SDR, one other representation that could possibly be in, have those bits in those spaces. I think I've got a, hold on. Oh, there we go, yeah. So these bits in these particular spaces, basically, um, there, is, there is only one of those. Now, if I were to change, um, let's, I wanna make it a big, big, big example. So it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, the two pictures are basically exactly the same. I, I like this as a bigger example. Uh, the B, now we're gonna start changing how many overlaps, how many, like the, the theta, essentially, we're calling it B in this example. Um, 
But so now the, we can define the overlap set by changing the theta, saying, okay, now we only need 30 bits of overlap with x. So now the overlap set expands hugely, right? So you got to think about matching. I've got an SDR and I want to know, um, I want to match it against other SDRs that I'm seeing because an SDR represents features in a space. And if I get another SDR, it's also representing features in a space. How close are those features to the features that I have? Are this, this, is this the same set of features? Is this something relevant? So we can do this with this, with this bit of math and we can, we can change how fuzzily we match, right? We, we match this SDR to the things that we're comparing it to by changing this theta value that I talked to, uh, talked about earlier. And, um, and, uh, here's and there's a huge number now of SDRs that fit into that space, you know, with 22 bits of overlap, and the chance of false positive is still really, really, really small. Um, not infinitesimally small, but super small. I mean, you're you're hardly ever, ever, ever going to get one. And like I said again, in your brain, when you do get a, a false positive or an error, typically you're on the right track. Like you're you're observing something similar than you had before. Uh, Okay, so, so this is about subsampling. These are all kind of old. I haven't played around with these in literally years. So, <laughs> um, so what would two overlap means? An overlap only makes sense when you're, thinking, when you're thinking of it with respect to the SDRs you're comparing. Like an overlap is just basically two SDRs, what, what's similar between two SDRs. Um, you, well, two overlaps, I mean, you, you can compare overlaps. You can say, well, I'm more similar to this input than that input by, you, by comparing the overlap score, I guess. Red apple and red herring, so now that's a different thing. That's a red herring, obviously. <laughs> um, that's context. And so now you're talking about context, which is really sort of different. The idea of um, red being a property of something, uh, yeah, intentionally. So in the sentence... Um, so, so you can sort of, I, I'm going to defer back to cortical IO, I think, because they've got a great demonstration, um, of how you can take the word, what was it? Um, what did they use? They said Jaguar, no, Apple minus computer, or was it computer <laughs> minus Apple equals Jaguar? I don't remember. So if you take the term Apple and you give it to cortical IO, they'll give you back an SDR representation for that word. They'll give you like a bitmap and it will have semantic meaning. Like the bits in it will have semantic meaning. That video that I showed earlier about the semantic folding tells you all about how they create these. Okay. So you could give it one for Apple. And if you, if you look at what it gave you, it's going to be a bit overloaded because Apple can mean more than one thing. An apple could be a fruit. An apple could be a record label for the Beatles and an apple could be a computer. Okay, so three major things that Apple could mean. Um, so it turns out if you take the SDR from the cortical IO uh, service for Apple, and you also ask them for the SDR for computer, okay? And then you say, subtract all of the bits from Apple from computer, you'll get a representation of an Apple that no longer includes computers. So it will just be the Apple representation uh, for, um, you know, the Beatles record company or the fruit, the apple. So you're trying to say, so those overlaps would be basically all of the semantics that are similar between all of those terms. So you could take perhaps three different terms that you think are unrelated and, and what are the overlaps in them? And that will give you the semantics, the things that they all have, um, in common. So that could be useful, right? Um, Say if you had if you took a a dog SDR, a badger SDR, and a bear SDR, and and you and you just compared them and only got their overlaps. And what were the, what do those bits represent? Well, probably like furriness, mammalness, you know, the thi things that walk on feet, things that are alive, you know, all the things, all the attributes or semantics of those objects uh, that that are true for all of them. I would say. Um, okay, cool. Back to what I was doing. Okay, so I want to talk, trying to talk here about subsampling. 
and I'm trying to remember what this even meant. Because like I said, it's been such a long time since I've, that it's, I've messed with this stuff. It looks like I've got three examples preloaded. Okay, so I have original SDR, which is really sparse. It's like 1%. And then I have a subsample. All right, so what I've done here is I've taken an SDR and I've only sampled half of the bits. So here's another thing you can, I, I remember what this is about now. Here's another thing you can do with SDRs that's tricky that your brain can do too, and probably does, um, is you don't have to store all the on bits. This is amazing, right? but you don't have to store all the on bits. Um, so if you, so for example, I, let's, let's go to the bigger sample here. I think it just makes more sense with a big sample. With the original SDR, 2% uh, sparsity, and this is a typical size that we use in HTM systems all the time, like 2048 bits in a layer of Cortex, um, or, or those might be 2048 mini columns, not, not actual um, neurons. Um, and then if you subsample them, so this means something, right? This, this representation over here, this, this means something. I don't know what it means, but it means something. So we're not gonna store all of the bits, we're just gonna store half of them. We're gonna store 20 of them, right? And then we're gonna take a random SDR and we're gonna compare it to Y. Uh, we're gonna compare the subsampled version to Y. And we're gonna see how close it is, right? Um, and I think what I was doing here was showing you that you will never get a false positive. You'll never, ever, ever get a false positive. Uh, with this one, you'll get a false positive really, really, really rarely. Um, but the, the thing is, you, you don't have to store all the bits. You can, you can get away with, with, with just storing half of the bits that you see, um, and you can still use that for comparison. That's how resilient um, this, this system is, this memory system is, that uses the sparse distribution of, of, of memory. That's how resilient it is to fault tolerance. You could literally take half the bits out of a represent, half the neurons could die in a representation and it could st you could still use it to, to uh, compare to things that are coming in and still have a decent representation. That's why when people have brain damage, they, they, could, they still have, sometimes still have overall function of things and they can build it back up and they can, they can relearn how, how to do things even though that they may have lost a lot of neurons or a lot of neurons have been damaged in their brain. Um, I don't think I ever, oh yeah. So, so you can twiddle with this, you know, and twiddle with the sparsity a lot and then and you can obviously get, get them depending on what, you're, what you make your theta to be. Uh, you can get them to, to have false positives and collisions and stuff like that. But um, for, the, for the most part, I just wanted to show that even if you just subsample the bits that are on, it's, that's still, in many cases, good enough. Good enough. Um, okay, so I've gone through like two, two, three episodes of HTM School now. This is for episode four. So uh, this is, I think this is one of my favorites. Um, I will, <laughs> this is tricky to explain though, because I, because I want to show you like a way you can um, accumulate a whole bunch of representations and then tell, given a new one, whether you've seen it before. This is, that's sort of what this is supposed to do. So, so here's an SDR that goes like all the way across the screen and I'm just gonna add a bunch of to it. You can sort of imagine that top one sort of dropping down. Every time I hit this button, I drop it down and, and I'm storing it, right? So I'm accumulating sort of this storage. You sort of think of this as my memory storage. I, I'm storing all these, oops, oops, I added the mini, I pressed the mini button. That's, that's okay. Let me st <laughs> so I added a couple hundred. Now I think there's over a hundred on this stack. Um, so given the fact that I've got, I've seen all these representations, um, I can look at, I can take this one here on top that I'm, and I can say, okay, don't add it, but I want you to match it. I want you to just tell me if you've seen it before. Okay. So it match it. Oh, I guess you, I, I'm going to actually pick one out of the, this is how I did this. I'm going to pick one out of the stack. And I'm going to say, have you seen this one before? I think that's what I did. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. So it says, yes, here, here it is. It's got the same, it's got four bits in common, which it has four bits. So that, that's the one that's, uh, it's hundred percent, but there's also these others that have one bit in common that I saw, right? So you can sort of see that on the bottom here. So on the right here, um, let me, let me, 
Yeah, so I'm gonna make it a little smaller. Um, you can. It, this works better when there's a when it goes. Let's go big. We're gonna go big. All right. When we go big, I just made these representations huge, and I'm not rendering all of them across the screen. Okay, I'm only rendering 12%. So you imagine that these representations go way off to the right. All right. I'm, but I'm only gonna show you this. It doesn't matter. I can just show you part of it, and you'll get the gist of it. So I've basically done the same thing. I'm gonna even add more. Um, okay, and then I'm say, okay, let's match one. Let's pick one out of it and, and try and match it to the rest of the stack. And so here we go. It, the, our theta is, there's, there's 40 on, and it's found this one that there's 30 overlap. Uh, and my theta, my matching is, is 32, which I can change, and it sort of changes the calculation, right? Um, so this basically gives me a stack rank of all of the SDRs I've seen, uh, just rank them all in order of how similar they are to this one that I've got. And if I'm over some threshold, if any of them are over that threshold, I'm gonna say, yes, I've seen this before. It's, here, here, it's probably this one, it's probably this one. And in this case, you know, uh, I made the threshold 30, I think. And so we're gonna say, yeah. Um, and now let's add noise. Uh, and this, uh, I've actually, I have 10 bits of noise. Oh, that's where the noise came from. Uh, and if you do calculate the false positive, even in this, uh, it's super, super small. I think the next one I have to do, yeah. Where is it? There it is. So in this case, it's 5.5 e to the negative 45th. Um, is there evidence that the cortex does subsampling? Um, well, just think of cell death. I mean, it's not, it's not like actively doing subsampling. The point is that if, you're, if your neurons don't work properly, you'll still get matches. So it's not like it's actively saying, I must perform subsampling too. It's just the way that it works. Um, looks a lot like a Pareto distribution. I'll have to put that, that, that sounds familiar, although I'm not a math guy or not a statistics guy. So looking that up real quick, hopefully they'll get a, Oh, yeah, 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 I think, you know, what, what, what you'll see this, what you'll see me referring to this is when we start talking about K winners in sparse or in uh, spatial pooling. So we do this in spatial pooling, we'll, we'll stack rank all of the SDRs. Okay, this, this is something we do do um, all the time. Um, we will take, uh, let's see, so all the mini columns, I haven't talked about spatial pooling yet, but all the mini columns in, in our spatial pooling operation have different receptive fields to input space. And given an activation in the receptive field, that lights up some of the, the mini columns and will decide which ones are active based upon their overlap, which is this, you know, this number right here, we would say, how much overlap they have with the current input. Um, but uh, I'll have to talk about that in another one because it's, it's, it goes, we're going a little bit beyond sparse distributed representations. Um, and then the unions. Okay, so this is neat too. I'm gonna go big immediately. Okay, so these aren't, these again go way off the screen. They're 2,048 bits. So this is the same deal. I'm adding, adding, adding. I'm gonna add 50 of them. But, but what happened here, as you can see, is that I'm accumulating them. I've got one representation that is a union of all the representations, right? And if you look down at the bits, you know, this bit is on because there's a bit right here. There's no bits here because there's nothing down here. So these are all on because one or more of these uh, SDRs here are on. Um, so instead of having to keep track of all of the SDRs that we've seen, we can squish them all into a union. And then we can compare with a random match against the union and tell whether we've seen it or not. And in this case, no, 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 we haven't. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't. The probability of a false positive here, given this union, and, and again, we're not even messing, we're not doing comparisons here. In the, in the previous screen I showed you, you might've noticed there was a, just a bit of a second lag or so when I, when I told it to match it was doing a manual comparison to all the different SDRs, doing a binary comparison to every single one of them. In this case, all I'm doing is comparing this SDR to this SDR. And if it's over whatever threshold I decide, in this case, this overlap is 14, and I'm telling it, uh, I don't, well, I don't look, it looks like I don't have it in the screen. Um, 
but uh, we, our chance of getting a, a false positive, it's not super, super low, but it's, it's, re it's really low. Um, it's still pre it's, it is pretty low. <laughs> but the more you add to it, watch that number, it, gets, it, co it goes higher because the union is getting overpopulated, right? So here I've got 66 SDRs in my union here, and it's so overpopulated that my false probability of false positive has creeped out of the scientific no notation range. So maybe we're getting a little bit too overloaded in this point, but it just shows you the power of being able to represent a whole bunch of sparse things in a dense way and still do valid comparisons, right? With, with new sparse things. Um, so this, I think this is really powerful and, and your brain takes advantage of this in, in a lot of ways, I think. Um, I don't know. Okay. So I've, I've done some of the basics. I could go on to encoding. Um, if you guys want me to go on to encoding or, or we could just chat about if you guys have anything else you want to talk about, because I mean, this is like the basics of, let me give you some resources let me, uh, before, before I do anything else. And if you guys have anything else you want to talk about, then throw it in the chat. Um, let's see, I'm going to go to nementa.com slash papers. And over here, I think there's like a topical. Yeah, so over here, if you just go to sparse distributed representations, um, go ahead and ask Falco. Um, or you can get into Discord voice chat if anybody wants to also um, and ask there. Falco, you're in the wrong place. There's a live stream voice chat. I, I didn't want to like muddle up the other one. Yeah. Hey, there you are. Hi. Nice, <laughs> yeah, to, hi. nice to hear you. <laughs> I hear you fine. You can ask your yeah. question. Yeah, I, I, I hear myself 17 times, so. Ah. Uh, can, can you hear me now? I can hear you. I, I can mute myself if that helps. Delay. Well, I'll, I don't like playing organ, organ so it's the same. Uh, this, this is difficult. I think, um, I think you have to. I wanted to know. Sorry, go ahead. There is a way to get rid of the echo and it's either you mute, you turn your speaker, you mute yourself, you, you mute me on, on that end or something like that. I, somebody did it earlier. <laughs> we'll see if we get it. And otherwise, I'm just going to mute myself in voice chat. Let me know what you want me to do. Um, hopefully you're not getting the echo, but there's, there's a bunch of, uh, papers here, um, about SDRs. The ones that I would probably, the one I would probably read first is this properties of SDRs and their application to hierarchical temporal memory. This is probably like the, the, the standard first paper to get. Um, I'm going to put it in chat here. Hold on. Oh, you can't mute the microphone without muting my headset. You know what I can do is I can mute me. So I muted myself in voice because you're the only one there. So hopefully you can hear me through discourse. <laughs> okay. I can hear you. Okay, so do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> All right. So um, I, I'm not sure if you've discussed it in detail, but apparently so in the sparse distribution, the semantics is not the, uh, the result of the, um, of the bits, but it's where the bits are located each to each other. Uh, no, no, not necessarily. It's, don't think about the location mm -hmm. of the bits. Um, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with their location. Or, do you mean like their location in the brain matter? I mean, if you if you look at ASCII five and ASCII six, there is only one bit difference, but that one bit difference has no semantic meaning. But when you look at um, red in your um, in your SDR, and you you look at bright red and, and dark red, yeah. then there is a lot of overlap. And but the number of bits that remain there are important. 
So I have, a, I have something I'll show you. Uh, I wasn't going to show encoders, but this is a good example, I think, of what you're just talking about. Um, let me do a scalar encoder. Um, so this should be uh, pretty cut and dry. So this is semantically representing a scalar value in a space. Um, this is from 0 to 100 or something. And then I, I haven't really bounded mm -hmm. it at the end. Um, this bit, like you, the only reason like the, these bits are close to each other and they, is just because the encoding logic that, that decided to encode this number in this way put them close to each other. Um, it doesn't really mean anything as far as the brain. Like, <laughs> the, you can do this exact same thing, and, it, and in fact, it's, it's almost better to do it in a more randomly distributed fashion. So let me show you this, this representation. As I move, and, and I can, I'm going to turn the comparison off so you can see, I'm moving from, this is the exact same basically function. It encodes numbers, scalar values, in a bit array. But as I move from 509 to 510, you, you can see the bits barely changing, right? The, the semantics are not changing much, but they're slowly mm. migrating through. You can't tell where. They're not going specifically from one place to another. They're just, they're just moving, you know? So by the time I get to 600, all the bits have changed, right? That means like the semant there are no, there's no semantic overlap between yes, yeah, 550 and 600, but you can change that you know by changing the resolution. So you can change it so that there's a lot of overlap. I think you have to have a low resolution for this. You can make it a lot of overlap. So when you change the bits of a lot of them change. So you can have a lot of control over how you represent whatever you're trying to represent in the space. Um, in the encoding logic. So encoding is really important to try. Yes. Hold up. All these, oh, the, the delay is really bad. It, it takes 10 seconds. Sorry. We go back to chat. Um, so actually, when, when, when you have two representations and let's say 80% overlap and 20% are different. That means that those two representations have a lot in common. They have a semantic uh, overlap. Um, Definitely. Right. Okay. And so if, um, if, I, if, if I encode something with a lot of semantic overlap, as a, as a programmer, as an external um, editor, I can make sure that my my system, my brain, has um, an understanding of those two features that that overlap, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the whatever is computing the, the SDRs are sort of how the data is represented, and there's it's it's hard to think about this. You have to think about data coming into the system, and if you're talking about the brain, we're talking about the neocortex, and you're talking about input to neocortical layers. And those are coming from other neurons. They're probably coming from sensory neurons or from, from neurons down lower in the hierarchy or, or parallel in the hierarchy or something. You can't make any assumptions about those neurons and what they represent ever. That's, that's the tricky thing, I think, when we're talking about the, you know, the canonical cortical algorithm in a cortical column. We, we can't assume what is, what, what is being mapped, what's coming in. We can't assume anything about the encoders. The encoding problem is almost like a completely different problem. And then the computation problem is should take whatever the encoders are sending and understand it. And, and to do that, it has to generate motor commands that operate within the environment the encoder, the encodings came from. Um, uh, <laughs> so Mark just said in chat that okay, well, there's a way, to, a way to mess up with just, speech I'm is what we're doing, doing right now. <laughs> Well, let me just say a last thing, um, respond to it, and after that I'll, I'll mute. And, uh, uh, so th the reason why I'm thinking of this problem is I was thinking about this um, um, MIDI encoder that you were talking about. And I have uh, quite some understanding of music. And actually, 
two notes sound well together if there is a certain relationship in the frequency. And that's why we like certain harmonies, because it's, it's actually physics. And so I was thinking, okay, if I want to make an encoder that an HTM system can automatically interpret and, and automatically make relations with, then I have to make sure that while I encode, I have to um, encode some kind of information that not only tells me this is uh, 440 hertz and this is 880 hertz, but also this is actually the octave of the other one. And it's also a quint, um, a fifth separated from this node, and it's also a, um, a third, uh, so that um, when the system is trying to say, okay, I should pick a node that is very harmonious, well then, uh, I, I should pick uh, in priority the octave, because it's more harmonious to the other node, than uh, a sixth, for instance, or a, or a, or, or, or a second. Okay? And by, by doing that, by imposing that encoder, you're actually cheating. And I think you're making um, a system that is not uh, general. You're making a, a system that is specific to understand music and not something else, while our brain is, is supposed to be very general. And that's where I'm, I'm, I'm lost. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, I've. I mean, this is an interesting thing to think about. I've thought about this a lot too. Um, uh, but you have to think about the context of the notes because um, it's not, you're right, it's not enough to just encode a C. You have to know what came before it to know what that C means. You have to know the interval that from the, the one before it to where it's at because C in music means different depending on what became before it. There's a different meaning to it. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it a, is it a, a, uh, a perfect fifth? Is it a seventh? Uh, is it a sixth? Those all have different meanings in music theory. Like they invoke different feelings in your brain, right? Uh, so, um, but uh, what you said was that these these harmonic properties, you know, the, these intervals exist in nature. It exists in sound, and and a lot of the things that I've been trying to figure out in my head is, does music the, the properties of music are those things that we invented up here in our brain culturally. How much of it is cultural and how much of it is just properties of the, the sonic attributes of, you know, matter around us? How, how, because if you think about the intervals and you're talking about, you know, different frequencies, as you go up the frequency range, the, um, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a logarithmic sort of range. So the higher you get, the the farther, I think, or is it less? The farther it is you jump when you just move the same amount of interval, if you're just talking about hertz, right? The, the wavelengths are moving faster and faster. So it's not necessarily just about this frequency to that frequency that defines an interval. It depends upon the note itself and where it is in the frequency spectrum to, to help you define where the next, where a next second or third or fourth or whatever interval is. Uh, up is closer. Okay, so whichever way it is, but it's but it's not a linear sort of, pr of frequency progression, right? I, as far as I understand it, I think it's a it's a it's a exponential or logarithmic frequency progression as you go up the scale. So that the yeah, so that the differences between the frequencies in the lower octaves are different than the one that the same interval is happening in the higher octaves, and that should be encodable, right? Because you're encoding that you can encode the frequency. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it really matters. It's just that, that it's different. You know, it's not linear. It's not linear. Um, the frequencies certainly go higher as they go up the scale, and I imagine that there the differences between the different frequency values is bigger because the because yeah because the lo the long wavelengths lower frequencies. Anyway, um, uh, it's a challenge. I don't know what the answer is honestly. <laughs> um, uh, it's a challenge, but I think that there are there are musical properties that we can extract in an encoder the same way that our ear does it, uh, or similar to how our ear does it. I think, I mean, we should, there, um, our ear is doing some computation um, because it's evolved to, you know, pair with our brain and help us survive. So you have to figure out how much do you want to learn from the ear? How much do you want to take from it? Um, the cochlea is actually, you know, is really complicated. Um, the the yeah well it's all about 
it's not just about whether the note's objective or the timbre's subjective. It's about the context of the note. It's about where you're at in the song. It's about what happened five minutes ago in the score. You know, it's, it's about the temporal context. Music is all about temporal context. So the same exact progression, the same exact interval in the same key, in the same octave, could mean something different if it's played in, in this part of the song versus that part of the song. So it's, it's all about temporal stuff. So if you, can if you can figure out the spatial properties of encoding sound, then your brain should figure out the meaning using the temporal layout of those sounds through time. That's where we should apply, be trying to apply meaning is in the understanding of the sounds as they progress through time. At least that's how, that's how I think about it right now, which changes sometimes, but. Um, uh, but if you use that part of the brain to do something uh, else, you have a problem? Is that, how would it work for other meanings? Um, oh, yeah, else. Uh, what do you mean if you use that part of the brain to do something else? Uh, the part of the brain that's listening to, to music or understanding music? Because I think uh, your whole experience, you know, you experience things with all your senses sort of at once. And... You, you might you might apply something an emotional meaning to a song because it played at a certain time in your life that had emotional meaning to you and that'll mean something it'll always remember you remind you of that day or something every time you hear it um uh the cortical oh you mean in cortical columns um yeah uh so i don't see a problem with cortical columns uh being able to i mean that's what sequence memory is it's it's uh, what i'm describing here is Spatial temporal sequence memory that we have we've talked about in, happening inside uh, cortical column layers using the spatial pooler and uh, spatial pooler to do uh, to inject you know consistent entrop entropic sparsity and then um, and then a temporal memory layer that uh, links them together through time um, and each one of our cortical col ugh, cortical columns is is doing that I think it works on all at, at all sensors I don't see a problem with it. Uh, I did did temporal encoding with a scale. I might have. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, I do. Yeah, but that. But I was just using that as an example, and I was doing a really dumb encoding. So I was encoding like this. Um, I took like, I took like an SDR. Let's say this is. I don't know. I just I just cut it up into pieces and and pretend this is a grid and has a thousand bits. I don't know. And so I would say this is an A, this is a C sharp. I don't remember what they were. I, I don't remember what they were. But but I would say if these all these bits represent A, and and if all of these bits represent C, so basically you'd see uh, the encoder would just encode this block of bits or that block of bits or that block of bits. It was a very dumb encoder. I wasn't trying to encode real meaning at all. I was just trying to show the sequence memory algorithm, recognizing the transitions between these states, right? Um, yeah, trans, uh, BitKing is saying he transposes scales. Uh, relative pitch is important, absolute's not as important. Yeah, I agree with that too. Um, yeah, the, yeah, try and think, if you can come up with a, a way to describe how to encode the spatial properties of sound <laughs> in a way that um, that we can we can use it to store meaning, you know, as as sound is played over time. <laughs> um, that would be interesting because I'd, I'd love to see that. Oh, you're gonna love this, guys! If you like music theory, Falco, did you know that I have a video with Charlie Gillingham of the Counting Crows? I hope you saw this because if you're interested in the music theory, um, I gotta find it now. It's in one of the hackathons. Music theory. Let me find it for you. Hold on. You, you guys have probably seen it, but I love this video. It's super interesting. I wish uh, I'd like to talk to Charlie again sometime. Whoops. Here it is. I'll throw it into chat. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> but um, that was a really interesting discussion on music theory. He talked about consonants and dissonance and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and the more I've thought about it since then, the more I think that we have to, that these are all spatial properties. And it's the brain, it's the cortex, it's the cortical column that's really um, 
parsing out the temporal context within this, the, all the spatial things that are happening in music and the encoder, the, you know, your ears that are encoding the spatial aspects of sound, they might be doing a little bit of, of prediction and, and temporal contextual stuff. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, but, uh, but I think that most of the temporal memory part of music understanding and replay and is, is really going on in the cortex. Um, I think it's, I've, I play guitar, obviously, and I, uh, I, it, it's hard for me not to think about temporal memory when I'm playing guitar. And it makes so much sense when you're trying to memorize sequences um, because the sounds go along with movements. Like as, as I'm moving my finger in a different place, I, I start to anticipate the sounds that are going to be made. And, and you're storing all these memories based on like your complete representation of, of reality, not just what you're hearing, but as you're moving and everything. Yeah, so you, so you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a whole experience. It's a, like a full body experience, especially if you're a musician and you play music. Um, the act of creating music is like a full body experience. And it's, it's much more enjoyable that way too, I think. Um, thoughts on synesthesia? Yeah, I think synesthesia, I think is, is sort of, uh, so if anyone doesn't know what synesthesia is, it's like there are some people who are born I don't know if I'd call it an ability, uh, but but <laughs> they they can hear uh, color or they can. Um, I think the most common way to think about synesthetics is is that um, they'll typically when they think of a number or a letter, they always associate a color to it or a sound or a, uh, or a tone or something you know that you ne regularly wouldn't associate with with something visual you know when you think about the number five some people always always think yellow like that's just part of the way that they think um and uh they call and there's uh, there's other ways you know when you hear something it, you get a you, you can see colors and i'm not synesthetic so i don't really understand what it means but someone in our in our offices said that they were synesthetic which was interesting um but the thing is you know you've got these regions in your brain where you might have an, an auditory region here and some other type of region here, and um, some of the some of the connections between regions. I mean, if you think about all the different variables that go into a growing brain and, and how dendrites grow and how far they grow and what directions they go and and everything. Um, uh, Mark says loops are joining sensory maps that are not connected in other people. Yeah, so. There, there's, there's probably, there's things in these people that are crossing these boundaries somehow to where I think, I think that um, things are sort of leaked from, from, one, from one sensory region to another or they're sharing information across region boundaries. Um, I'm gonna, okay, I have another <laughs> resource for you. Um, I think, here we go. So, I interviewed David Eagleman and we talked about synesthesia. So <laughs> you can see him and me talked about him. And here's the brain. Here's the brain I used in that video. Do you guys know who David Eagleman is? He's like one of the most famous neuroscientists that I know. Um, but he was nice enough to let me uh, interview him. So we had a fun time. Professor at Stanford, and director of Center for Science and Law. Um, anyway, um, we talked about synesthesia. He had a better explanation of it than I did. Um, yeah, that was, that was my first interview with a neuroscientist. I was super nervous because I, I, I cold called him. Well, he'd been to our office before, actually. He's interested in our work. Um, he wrote uh, a recommendation. For, was it, what do you call it, a referral? Whatever, for Jeff's, for our latest paper, you know, the Frameworks paper. Um, Hey, thanks for the follow. Nice to see you, Mike, Mike Malak. What are you up to? What's, what's going on? Hey, I promised that you guys, it's been over an hour, and I promised you guys I was gonna, I was gonna donate some subscriptions, so let, let me do that. I think it's time, and then, we're and then we'll do a raid, all right? So I gotta, let me figure out how to donate some subs. Um, yeah, I know, look, check this out. I got double digit viewers, I got 50 followers. Um, I'm gonna go to the video page and figure out how to 
do this gift a subscription I'm gonna do to the community we're gonna gift five subs to the community and I think this will work I've never done this before so we'll see I have to pay I have to pay for it that's okay let's see these guys should be like getting subscriptions any minute now and that means like I said earlier oh I need to put my postal code in <laughs> Hold on. Uh, Amazon you know Amazon owns twitch right <laughs> seamless seamless integration with their payment system <laughs> uh, here we go come on it's chugging away it's trying it's trying I'll show you this is my screen it's like hey I think it worked You're, yeah all right so I just got so you all right Falco Freeman Revolta Bit King RxJ you, you guys all got subscriptions to the channel so uh, I just appreciate you guys all watching and that means like for the next month that means that you, there was a subscription that was new that's new too right you like that <laughs> Um, for the next month, you guys will see uh, no ads on this channel, and I think you'll get like custom emotes and stuff. I'll still, I'm still figuring out that all that jazz. So, uh, thanks for watching. I, I, it's just for fun. Look, you got a little like star by your name. Do you see that? See that? And chat. If you're in, if you're in Twitch chat, um, let's see. It gives you a little star by your name. Let's pause that. I went away. There it is. There's your little star. It says you're a subscriber. Um, and I don't, I, there's something else that I, that I'll figure out some other, something else that I can do. Uh, like I can give VIPs and somehow there's custom emotes, but I have, there, I have to like decide what my custom emotes are going to be and create them. And I haven't done any of that stuff yet. So in the meantime, here's, here's one. Here's, oh, this is one in a betas cat emotes yeah there's a cat <laughs> in the chat a cat in chat um, okay so let's find some one to raid off to now yeah definitely I'm gonna make a brain for sure I mean you saw the brains uh, let's see who am I gonna I'm gonna go see who who I'm following that is uh, that we could go raid I did rhyme me once already um, hey, it's fine. I just did a, it's cool, Falco. I, I just did a like random subscription. So it's just in celebration of becoming a, a Twitch affiliate. I want to do something nice. Um, do you guys want to go to the, um, I love this, um, <laughs> the fish channel. There's a channel here that just, yeah, it's showing an ad. Did you get to see enough ads on this? There's a channel that's just a fish tank which I like, I thought it was very calming. Aside from the explosions of the first person shooter ad advertisement before it. <laughs> Here we go. This is it. <laughs> um, oh, oh yeah, Coder doing AI. Let's see if someone I know is, nobody's online right now. So there is hardly anybody doing AI. That I found somebody that I noticed, D R X D X Y. I forgot his name. Um, um, let me go. Let me go look. Actually, on my page under followers, he's. Whoops. Somehow, okay. There we go. D Y X. Oh, this guy, Diz Dizzy L. No, no, that's not him. Maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, this is the guy, I think. Um, but he's not here. He's not online right now. Usually he plays Magic, but lately he's been doing, like this This last video of him, he was doing anomaly detection with, uh, it was spatial anomaly detection um, with Pi Data. Uh, he said he was going to come back and do it, but I don't see him online right now, so I don't think there's any, I don't think I, we can raid him. So we have to, we'll have to find somebody else. Um, but n honestly, nobody's doing machine learning har hardly at all. Um, 
Um, hopefully you saw um, M G Stein, who I just saw, who I just went to is, what was it, M D X L or something like D Z Y L, D Z Y L. Okay, I'll, I'll put it D Z Y L. That's the guy's name. Um, but who is live? We could go back to. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know this guy. Let's go to him. He's got a bunch of viewers. What's he working on? He's working on JavaScript. It's a main thing, so let's go with um, it's it's not bad to, to start rating some people that have a lot of a lot of viewers because you know that's how you get viewers. <laughs> Raid that guy. You guys ready? Here we go. Three viewers are ready. Four viewers are ready. You guys ready to raid? This will be fun. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm gonna do this every Monday. I'll be back live streaming my work uh, tomorrow morning. So if you wanna check in with me tomorrow morning, I'll be back online. And we are ready to go. Take care, everyone. All right.